testing, signal versus background, understanding the statistics, and putting everything that we see in a bigger picture. Okay, so that's how I define collider phenomenology. And the Large Hadron Collider, uh, as you know, started 10 years ago, more or less, slightly more than that. And um, he had many ancestors, a previous collider, but um, that the LHC has built upon in terms of understanding of things, but uh, it's really got us to an energy scale that was never reached before. And we are here only after 10 years of successful running where billions of events have been collected at 7 TV, 8 TV, 13 TV, and now the, the shutdown is um, going to stop soon, probably at the end of 2021. And after that, there is, will still be 20 plus years of cutting edge phenomenology because I will show you in the next slides that already now the precision of the experiment has pushed us to the limits of uh, and, and to, to go beyond what we can do now in terms of techniques. And this will be even more when the high luminosity phase will start because uh, a factor of 10 more luminosity will be collected. So we actually factor five to 7.5% of the nominal luminosity will be reached. So there will definitely be a lot of interest in physics to do, a lot of data to be analyzed, a lot of interpretation to be made out of it. So here, this is one of the summary slides by Atlas, where it's very interesting because the standard model production cross-section are compared to the measurements for proton-proton, inelastic jets, dye jets, photon, W, Z, T, T bar, and so on, down to states that have larger multiplicity, so more particles in the final states. And you can see that it's really impressive to see the level of agreement between the standard model predictions and the experimental measurements done at different center of mass energy. So I can show you a bit better in the next slides where you show the ratio between the data which are these colorful things, these colorful bars, so purple, orange, blue, depending on the center of mass energy. And in gray, there are the theoretical prediction with the theoretical uncertainty of our prediction. And there are several aspects that are very interesting. So first of all, you can see that for some of the final state, the theoretical uncertainty is bigger than the experimental uncertainty. So the, we are really pushed as theorists, as phenomenologists, to go beyond to have smaller theoretical uncertainties. And also that the agreement, broadly speaking, is very good. You know, so you can see some deviations, but for observables that uh, are very poorly measured at the moment or like uh, predicted with some degrees of systematic uncertainties. And given that everything you see here, this impressive degree of um, agreement is all thanks to QCD, if you want. So the predictions you see here is all QCD predictions plus some epsilon that has to do with other effects. So QCD is really the key not only to produce in that, but also QCD has had to be understood so much better because of the pressure of the experimental precision. And new techniques have been developed, uh, new very cutting edge mathematical tools have been developed to go uh, farther and farther in our QCD expansion. So let me just say a few words about QCD. Of course, you need uh, at least a five hour lectures to say some meaningful about QCD, but I just want to tell you what are the basic ideas that we will see coming back over and over throughout these lectures. So the first experiment where the nature of the strong force, so the strong nuclear force that holds the nuclei together, was done by the deep inelastic scattering experiments in the 60s at ZLAC, where very highly energetic um, electron or positron 
we're hitting a proton target or a nuclear target, okay? And um, these experiments were characterized by the center of mass energy of the proton uh, and, um, and the bin of electron, the momentum transfer of the virtual particle that is exchanged in this kind of scattering, and the scaling variable X, which is a macroscopic variable that uh, is something that when X is equal to one, you have an elastic scattering. So the proton is not broken by the incoming highly energetic beam of electron or positron. And when X is smaller than one between zero and one is the inelastic scattering. So when the proton is broken as a result of the collision with this highly energetic beam of electron. And what people were expecting for the inelastic component. So the, the cross section for this process can be parameterized in terms of structure functions, which are this function that depend on the scaling variable x and on the momentum transfer q squared that give us an idea of what is the inner structure of the proton. And before these experiments, people were expecting to see structure function that were reflecting a strongly bound components of the proton. So as if the proton was made by something that was really, really strongly bound inside. So something with a really strong, for example, dependence on Q squared. But the surprising finding was uh, what was then interpreted by the Parton model. So it was as if this exchange particle, this virtual photon were scattering incoherently of massless and free point like spin one half partons. So what this experiment found to be the first approximation of the structure of the proton was absolutely surprising. Nobody would have expected to find three point like spin one half partons. And also that this X, so which is a macroscopic variable, could be linked to the fraction of the proton momentum that each of these partons was carrying. So uh, this Parton model in its simplicity was absolutely uh, mind blowing, if you want, after it was discovered. So that one could really write the structure function as something that does not depend on the virtuality of the exchanged particle and only depending on these, what are called Parton distribution function, which are the probability that a parton of kind i carries a fraction x of the proton momentum. So this is something that motivated the search for a weakly coupled theory at high energy. Okay, so and clearly this is a very simplified version because in the meantime, you know, there was all uh, the Gelman discoveries and so on. But um, you know, in time, somehow this led to identify the non-abelian quantum field theory based on the SU3 gauge group of color as the theory that can explain the findings of these deep inelastic scattering experiments. So this is the Lagrangian or the QCD that you might have seen many times with uh, you know, the, 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 the quark fields which are in the fundamental representation of SU3 and the gluon fields, which are in the adjoint representation of SU3. But the key features of QCD, which we will find throughout all these lectures, are mostly two. So the first one is really the asymptotic freedom, which is what explains the Parton model, as I will show in the next slide, and what allows us to do any form of perturbative expansion in the strong coupling constant, OK? So it's the, with this ultraviolet property of QCD, which is asymptotic freedom, is at the basis of two of the most important things I will say in these days. And the other property of QCD, which is crucial, and I will mention a bit more tomorrow, is the universality, which is an infrared property of QCD that has to do with, Q, with collinear factorization, which I will mention tomorrow, parton shower, resummations, and so on and so forth. Okay. So let me just introduce in a bit more quantitative way this concept of asymptotic freedom. 
So one of the first tests of quantum chromodynamics was the measurement of what was called the R ratio, which is defined as the cross section for E plus E minus going into hadrons divided by E plus E minus going to muons. Um, and uh, in the Parton model, if you compute what this ratio is supposed to be, this is very simple. It's simply a number, R0, which is the sum of the charges squared of the partons that are inside the protons. So at, at leading order, you only have quarks. But then we know QCD is true, so you have to add quantum corrections to this uh, tree level uh, result. So when you add the first order QCD correction, so you go to next to leading order in the perturbative expansion of QCD, you get uh, a correction that is su surprisingly simple, it goes like alpha s divided by pi, okay? Where alpha s is the strong coupling constant squared divided by four pi. When you add the second order QCD correction, so virtual and real correction, double real and virtual correction, you get, you get, I oh know it's not me. Okay. Okay, anyway, so you get this next, to the next leading order correction that gives you a ultraviolet divergence here, okay? That doesn't cancel, but as usual, we know what to do in quantum field theory. We have a renormalization procedure and you deal with the ultraviolet divergence with the renormalization of the bare coupling constant of QCD. So as soon as you do that, so you dress, you redefine a uh, a coupling constant and now depends on the renormalization scale in terms of the bare constant, this divergence disappears. And now we have a renormalization group equation for the coupling constant of QCD, which is this, the famous beta function of QCD. And what is really fascinating about QCD, that first of all, by the way, the techniques have been refined to an incredibly high accuracy so that now these loops uh, that bring us to the determination of the beta functions are known up to before, so up to five loops. So we, this is impressive. But if we look at the result at one loop, it's very it's uh, what makes us understand why um, you, know, you get this asymptotic freedom because the quark loop diagram, which are this one, contribute with negative terms, so depending on the number of quark flavor you have, to this first constant B0 that you have in the expansion. Well, if you look at the gluon loop that you have because of the non-abelian nature of QCD, the diagram gives a positive contribution, which is proportional to the number of colors you have in QCD. And this is what is dominant. And this is what makes this beta function overall negative. So. The behavior we have in QCD, which is what allows us to do perturbative expansion up to very high energy, is opposite to the behavior we have in QED, thanks to the presence of this self-interacted gauge boson. So if this is what happens in QCD, so that the strength of the coupling decreases as Q squared increases, which is the opposite of what we all have studied in QED that the strength of the coupling increases with uh, the scale increasing, okay? So the perturbative region is uh, closer to the smaller values of Q squared. So this is really just to, to give you a flavor of what is so special about QCD. Okay, any question about that? Okay, sorry, I keep going. Um, so, the strong coupling constant, which I've just introduced now, is one of the main ingredients that we need if we want to do precise phenomenology at the LHC. So what is the event that experimentalists observe when you are at the LHC? So this is a picture of one of uh, the events uh, recorded by CMS in one of the four big experiments at the LHC, which is proton-proton to top 
the top decays into a bottom quark and to a W boson, and the W boson decays into a muon and the neutrino, Z and a, a, a quark, which hadronizes into a bunch of hadrons, okay? And you can see the muon is this one, is the one that reaches the muon calorimeters, and uh, here these two are the two electrons, and then you have one quark, this, this quark here hadronizes into a jet and so on. But anyway, just to say that what you actually observe in each of these events is something extremely complicated because the particles that are produced, what we predict in theory using QCD, decay, hadronize, radiate radi radiations in forms of soft radiation at all points. So we really want to describe with our theory events that are as complicated or even more than what I'm showing you in this picture. Okay, so how do we do? This is a schematic representation of how we actually make theoretical prediction that match this uh, experimental picture at the LHC. So I think this is comes from some, someone from Sherpa. So we can identify uh, a lot of things, but they can be split into different things, so into smaller parts and we can put them together. So here, where there is the red dot, there is really the actual hard scattering of the two main partons that come out of the proton and participate to the hard scattering, okay? And this is what is the bit that we compute using perturbative QCD and expanding in the strong coupling constant, adding electric corrections and so on and so forth. On top of that, we have to know the structure of the proton. So we have to convolute, I will tell you a bit more tomorrow, uh, whatever we have here with the functions that at the leading order give us the probability that this particular parton is kicked out of the proton, if you want in pictorial terms, and interacts with this other parton to create some final states. On top of that, we have all the parton showering. So each of these partons here emits soft radiation that then um, becomes collimated into hadrons, which are the color singlet things that we observe. And then we have mul multiple parton interaction, underlying events. So it's really complicated, the, the phenomenological picture that we have in order to describe the events. But what allows us to do anything about that and have this precise prediction that I was showing before is that we can really split these into different parts and put them together. So it's really the factorization of each of this contribution. The fact that each of these things happen at a different scale is what allows us to compute these things one at a time by exploiting the fundamental properties of QCD and put them together in a theoretical prediction, okay? So this is really the LHC master formula. So that the cross-section for two protons going into some final state A and B can be written as the convolution of these functions, which are the parton distribution function that parameterize the proton structure, which I will tell you more about tomorrow. The partonic cross-section for parton I and J that come from this proton and the other proton into AB. And here the center of mass is the partonic center of mass energy. So it's the original one of the two proton multiplied by the fraction of momenta carried by the two partons. And here you have all the renormalization scale dependence on the strong coupling constant and the factorization scale, which I will mention tomorrow. And again, these are things that you can add on top of the partonic cross-section by doing parton shower, exploiting the factorization methods. And then you have a lot of soft stuff because this factorization is true up to higher twist, multiple partial interaction underlying event. Okay, so the fact that each of these boxes, if, is, if you want independent of the other, is what allowed the progress in, part, in um, phenomenology, okay? So because we have the strong coupling constant everywhere and I've introduced it before, let me just say a few words about it because it's very important. 
So the strong coupling constant alpha s. Of course, this is a parameter of QCD, no? And you know that whenever you do perturbative QCD, all theoretical predictions are expressed in terms of the renormalized coupling constant alpha s at a scale mu square, which is a non-physical renormalization scale. And then you also have a dependence on the factorization scale, mu f. Usually what we do is that we take these scales close to the scale of the momentum transfer in a given process. So what is alpha s is the indication of the effective strength of the strong interaction in that particular process. And besides the quark masses is the only free parameter of the QCD Lagrangian. However, it is not a physical observable, rather it's a quantity which we define in the context of perturbation theory, which enters the predictions for the measurable observables. So everything we do depends on our knowledge of these parameters, okay? And if you look at the most recent uh, PDG, particle data group in 2020, um, we have uh, you know, various measurements of alpha s at different values of Q. So you can see how beautifully the asymptotic freedom prediction by QCD is verified by data. And also you can see that uh, information about these very fundamental and important parameters that enters our predictions everywhere comes from a number of observables, tau decay, um, the heavy quarconia, electric precision fits, and then from some particular observables from proton-proton collider like the LHC or proton-antiproton like the Tevatron. So just to give you an idea of, you know, because we use alpha S for the predictions at the LHC, but we use the LHC to improve our knowledge of alpha S. There is a bit of this exchange between the two things. So let's take one of these measurements. For example, this. So our this data is how well we know alpha S at the mass of the top, okay? And this comes from the top anti-top measurements at the LHC. What do people do to extract this purple point with an error band, which contributes to our understanding of the strong coupling constant? So what people do in this, for example, the CMS determination of the mass of the top and alpha S, they look at the top anti-top production cross-section. In this case is in the leptonic channel. So where each of the W decays into a lepton. And the results for these measurements depend on the experimental systematics. So you have the data. So basically what they do is that they measure the agreement of the theory to data by looking at the log likelihood, which is the chi-squared. So this is the data. These are the theoretical predictions that depend on alpha s. These are the correlation between the experimental data and the experimental uncertainties. And this is, again, the data and the theory. So they draw a chi-square profile, and they take delta chi-square equal 1 Okay, to, uh, on the space of the parameters. So they look how good is the agreement between the data and the theory as you vary alpha s in the theoretical prediction. Okay, so this is what is done. And this is done for a number of observables. So this is just an example. It's something I will mention again in our third lecture because there are a lot of subtleties in this procedure. But just to say how the things like alpha s, which is a fundamental parameter, comes from before, but is always informed by this precise QCD analysis that we do at the LHC. Very good. Let me just say a few more words about another fundamental ingredient of the formula, this LHC master formula that I showed you before and that I take here, which are these partonic cross section. Okay, so how well we can use perturbation theory to measure this thing to the utmost precision we can have, okay? So um, I just remind you 
the, the master formula the, for the platonic cross-section. So we have always the flux factor, the phase space, and then you have the squared matrix element, which depends on these two on physical scales. And what we do is that we take the diagrams for our theory and we expand them in perturbation theory. So we start, we have a short distance cross section that is an expansion in alpha S that comes from the theory and we compute it at leading order. We add the next to leading order correction, next to next to leading order correction and so on. The value of you know, the leading order power of the process is process dependent. So for example, if you have uh, Z production, you have alpha S to the zero. So K naught is zero. But if you have, uh, for example, TT bar production, you already start with alpha S to the second. Okay, so the, the first power of alpha S depends on the process, but then you expand. So you keep adding real correction, virtual corrections and so on. So if we take a 222 process, so the leading order is something that we can all compute maybe in two hours, one hour <laughs> uh, on a piece of paper. If you compute the next leading order correction, again, that's something that we have learned how to compute it really well because you have to add the real correction. So an extra emission, and then you have the one loop correction that interferes with the tree level plus the complex conjugate. And up to here, it's something that, you know, we, thanks to people who have worked really hard in the past 30 years, we know really well how to do it. It's a kind of, until we have two particles or three or four, it's harder. But then when we go to next to next leading order correction, things start becoming more complicated because you have double real radiation, you have um, one loop, uh, that uh, two to three that interferes with that. You have two loop corrections that interfere with the tree level and then one loop correction squared. So you have many ingredients in order to go to the next to next to leading order term in your perturbative expansion, okay? And this is where the most progress has been made in the past uh, years. So if you look at what happened, this is the timeline for the next to next leading order computation. This was presented in the talk at the end of the last year. You can see that thanks to this um, impressive range of techniques, which are amplitude techniques to, to, to deal with all, the, with all the divergences you have here, people, there is really huge number of amplitudes at NNLO that have been computed. No? So we started from TT bar in 2013, and now we have a huge number of two to two or two to three, even starting particles that we know have next to next leading order. So it's really an explosion. And what is also new, you know, I would I would have to have a whole talk devoted to these techniques because they've been really, really, they're really fascinating. It's a beautiful mathematical construction. But the other thing is that when you, people also started to compute the next cube leading order for some of the processes that are very relevant at the Large Hadron Collider. So, so far five processes have been computed at next cube leading order and on top of the precision that has been improved, I think it's very interesting because it gives us a strong indication about the perturbative series convergence. No? So we know that eventually all perturbation series are only asymptotic, you know, they never converge, but having calculation on next cube allows us to see how things go in the intermediate range that we have now. Um, yes, and this is simply to say that um, as uh, more particles we have in the final state, the harder becomes to, to do this kind of computations, okay? Um, so before going to the next cube leading order, which is what I'm gonna talk about in the next 10 minutes, just let me give you uh, just one example of how important are the next to next to leading order corrections. I just give you an example. No? So in 2013, the early measurement by Atlas and CMS 
of the WW production, so the W per production, were off the theoretical prediction by about three sigma. And um, at the time, these predictions were known at next reading order. So there were, of course, you know, a lot of investigation of possible beyond the standard model effects like uh, supersymmetric Chargino production and so on. But then in 2014, there were the computation of the next to next to leading order, the inclusion of some resummation effects I will mention later. And the discrepancy was strongly reduced. So basically went back in agreement with the standard model. So here you can see the, the picture for that. So um, this was eight TV run, and these were the prediction that you could do using different PDF sets. And you can see that there was this disagreement. As soon as this next to next to leading order was include, included on top of some of the resummation, you see that the theoretical prediction went towards the experimental uncertainty. So I think that going back to what I said at the beginning, that um, precision is really needed in order to give strong ground to the claims that we make. Uh, is super important. And this is an example of that. Okay, so now let me just tell you what's going on with the next cube leading order calculations. So the first one, uh, the first process for which the next cube leading order was computed was proton proton into Higgs via gluon fusion. It's the main mechanism production for the Higgs. So it's very important. And um, then there are these other ones that I will mention later. And we see why it's important. Uh, so because if one computes the effective vertex, so you integrate out the mass of the top to infinity, this is the approximation in which the next cube leading order is known, you can see that the perturbative series starts at order alpha S squared. But then if you look at the coefficients in front of the successive powers of alpha S computed at the renormalization scale M Higgs divided by two, you can see that the coefficients grow as alpha increases. You know? So this is clearly not a good example of convergence. Okay, so you can see that if you go leading, next to leading, next to next to leading, next cube leading, you only, you really need the next cube to start seeing a convergence. And that's something, um, so, sorry. Uh, and let's have a look at these coefficients, you know, how, how they come from and what these tell us about. So, we know, I told you before, that the perturbative series is written in terms of powers of alpha s of mu r, where mu r is the renormalization scale, which in this case is taken to be equal to the mass of the Higgs divided by two. This is a choice which is completely arbitrary. No? So uh, they are chosen about the order of the mass of the Higgs, but whether it's the mass of the Higgs, the mass of the Higgs divided by two or divided by four, it's a choice. And indeed, how we understand what is the uncertainty due to missing higher orders that we have not included in that, in that perturbative expansion is by introducing variations of the renormalization scale. So typically, we look at how the calculation changes when you set the renormalization scale to twice the central value or half with respect to the central value and this gives uh, higher order terms. So we estimate what is the impact of missing higher order terms in your perturbative expansion by varying this renormalization scale, for example, okay? So let's have a look at what happens. Um, again, in the expansion that I showed you before. So the leading order, so here, if you take mu naught equal to m Higgs divided by two, the leading order, when you do the scale variation of a factor of two goes between here and here. So this is somehow the standard estimate for the missing higher order uncertainty. So we expect the next leading order to be somehow in this region over here, between here and here. So when the scale is varied by factor of two. 
The next two leading order has been computed that is completely off com with respect to this initial uh, prediction. Then they go to the next to next leading order. And again, you vary the scale. You expect these to be here, but it's slightly off again. So it's, it's not within the band of missing higher order uncertainty that was foreseen by the knowledge of the previous order. Only at the next cube leading order, you start seeing a convergence because this, which is this region, which is foreseen by the next to next leading order, you find the next cube leading order calculation to be there. Okay. So um, this is a convention that starts working only on next cube leading order. So the convention is that missing higher order uncertainty is estimated by a change of the cross section when varying these scales up and down by a factor of two, okay? So let's uh, see again what I showed you before, but in a different format. So when you take the, the central scale, like mass of the Higgs divided by two, the leading order is completely off the next to leading, the next to leading barely um, overlaps with the next to next, and the next cube is in the next to next leading order, okay? So this is a good news because we start seeing that when we go to next cube leading order, the choice of mu r and mu f doesn't matter much. Again, if you had taken the central scale like mass of the Higgs instead of mass of the Higgs divided by two, the picture would be a bit less nice than what we have seen because, you know, of course there is still convergence but it's less, um, um, you know, nice than what we've seen for a central value of the scale equal to the mass of the Higgs divided by two. Another process that uh, has been computed. So in a sense with the Higgs, it seems that uh, if you keep going to higher scale, then you're gonna be fine, okay? But the Drelian is a very interesting process because the ne next cube leading order correction was computed recently, uh, both for neutral currents, so both for photon exchange, so Q Q bar into E plus E minus and for charge current. And this was the typical process for which going from next to leading to next to next to leading, so from yellow to blue, everything seemed to be fine. In a sense, the next to next leading order band was included within the next to leading order missing higher order uncertainty. And the size of missing higher order uncertainty was estimated to the level of 1%. So you can say, wow, we have precision here. However, in contrast to the correction of the Higgs production, the shift of the predicted value of the Drelian cross section due to the inclusion of next cube, the, the red thing, is not contained within the naive scale uncertainty that one has at next to next. So the convergence deteriorates. So for the virtuality of a photon equal to 400 or below, there is not overlap between. So one could say that there is a failure, if you want, of the convergence. And the same thing happens if you look at the W exchange. It's a similar situation for the W plus and W minus production. Everything seems fine up to next to next leading order. We expect things to go even better on next cube. This doesn't happen, okay? So there are a lot of things to say. Um, I don't think this tells us that perturbative calculation failed, but probably it indicates uh, um, a way that in which we estimate the theoretical uncertainty related with missing higher order uncertainty that is not uh, the best way, probably. So I think this calls for an improved method to estimate missing higher order uncertainty. For example, there is this publication by Marco that I think it's very interesting. Also, there is a mismatch between the perturbative order in the partonic cross section and the PDFs. That's something I will mention tomorrow. Okay, and um, sorry, maybe I stop in case someone has any questions now, because then I will go to the last um, section of my talk um, in which I would like to talk about uh, um, progress in understanding things beyond what I just mentioned, which is fixed order QCD calculation. Okay, so if I don't hear a question, I keep going, but then please feel free to interrupt me again whenever you want. 
Okay, so um, in these last um, 10 minutes, whatever, I want to give you um, an idea of the progress that has been made and that is necessary in order to improve our knowledge of the protonic cross-section beyond fixed order QCD. The first big chapter is about electroweak corrections, because given that roughly uh, the value of the electromagnetic coupling alpha at the mass of the Z is about the alpha strong divided by 10, if the, the importance of next to leading order electroweak corrections is of the same, more or less of the same size of next to next to leading order QCD correction. That's a naive estimate, um, but it really means that go beyond the leading order in alpha S electromagnetic is expected to be very important. And in fact, it is, no? um, especially in some regions, because we know that when you have a QCD process and you add electroweak correction, so, you know, vertices of alpha electromagnetic here in the loops when you calculate the virtual correction you have a coefficient here that can be large because we have this Sudakov logarithms that come out of the computation of the loop here such that when you go to a large center of mass energy of the partonic cross section compared to the mass of the exchange virtual boson, uh, you really have large logarithms that might spoil the perturbation convergence. So that's why it's extremely important to include that, especially when we look at things like invariant mass distributions that have large partonic cross-section. Um, and then on top of the virtual correction, you have to compute real corrections like quark initiated, or even photon initiated real corrections for which you need to associate a part on distribution functions also to the for to, to the photon. So you also need to parameterize what is the fraction of the proton momentum carried by photons as well, not just by quarks and the gluon. Okay. So uh, recently there have been many beautiful results that have been presented in the literature that really show that uh, um, the computation of electroweak correction is very important. So for example, here, if you look at the Drellian, which is the process I was showing you before, if you do uh, a pure NLO QCD calculation or NLO is within here and you correct with the electroweak correction, you have a strong shift up to 20% in the large invariant mass tails. Um, and it's very important that this doesn't come only naively from this virtual Sudakov correction, but it comes from a compensation between virtual and real correction, because basically the uh, electroweak correction, this Sudakov factor tends to decrease, so to, to make uh, um, yeah, to decrease the cross-section while the photon initiated tends to increase it. So what you see here as the most precise cross-section, including electroweak, compensates the effect of initial photon and the effect of the Sudakov logarithms of the virtual corrections. So I think one of the frontiers now where there is lots of activity is really in merging the next to next to leading order QCD calculation with the next to leading order electroweak. So here, is an example from you know this matrix plus open loops to really include automatically an NLO correction plus an NLO electroweak in these very important processes. And you can see here that the impact of this correction is very, very important. Okay, so excluding one of the two would bring to a very wrong result if you want by 20 or 30 percent in the high PT tail. And there are many groups uh, that are working in doing that. Another thing that uh, perhaps uh, I will skip, but it's something I worked quite a lot about it. Um, I, I will just give you an understanding is that, you know, we always talk about QCD corrections and that's 
very important, but whenever you have bottom quarks that feature at the hard process level, there are two ways, two schemes in QCD in which you can deal with the process. So you can have a four flavor calculation in which the B quark can only produced in the final state or a five flavor in which the bottom quarks are produced inside the proton. So this pink bubble is the proton, okay? And in one scheme, you have to consider the bottom quark to be massless. And in this scheme, instead you, you consider all the mass effects. And um, okay, I won't go into that because otherwise I talk too much. Um, so there are different advantages and disadvantages of, of these two schemes. So for example, bottom, bottom fusion into Higgs. This is the leading order diagram in the four flavor scheme. This is the leading order diagram in the five flavor scheme. So some of the scheme we sum, some of these logarithms, some do not. Anyway, so I think um, this is an area where people are working a lot because the results in different schemes for some of the processes give very different results. So I think the differences between these two schemes have been um, understood much more in the past few years because um, uh, there has been an improvement in the perturbative calculation and also in the understanding on how to take things computed in the four flavor scheme and in the five flavor scheme and it matched and get the best of these two ways of computing it um, in a complementary way. So we can have much calculations that include the bottom quark effects and the resummation at the same time. So there is a lot of activity in matching processes in massive versus massless schemes with heavy quark initiated processes, especially differential level, which is very complicated thing to do. Okay, uh, I cannot finish my talk without talking briefly about resummation because as you know very well, um, when you have a complex environment like the Large Hadron Collider, many observables depend on more than one scales. You have single or double logarithms of the ratios of those scales at all order in perturbation theory. And if these logarithms are large, the convergence of the perturbative series is spoiled. And you need to go from a fixed order expansion to a all orders expansion, which, in which you resum this logarithmic contribution to all orders. There are lots of things like that. So a lot of um, large logarithms in different regions. So for example, take the transverse momentum of the Higgs. Uh, which uh, this is a nice cartoon from Lucas talk at QCD at the LHC. So um, this is the experimental measurement. Hmm? So as a function of the PT of the Higgs, this is the cross section divided in beans. So we know very well that here you have this logarithm of the PT of the Higgs divided by its mass that are extremely important. Unless you resum this logarithm, you do not you're not able to describe theoretically this part of the spectrum. On top of that, there are other logarithms of the mass of the bottom quark, which are very important in this intermediate region of the PT. And there are threshold resummation logarithms, which have these four and that start kicking in when you look at the large PT region. So just to say, this is an example to say that whenever we want to describe things at the differential level, you really need to care about this enhancement and about the very beautiful mathematical techniques we have in order to resum them to all orders. Here, I, I don't have time to say it. I just simply wanted to say that there is a lot of effort, not only in improving that, but also into combining different kinds of resummations at different orders. Uh, Semi-conclusion, so just to say that so far in this talk, I could only talk about fixed order, QCD and electric calculations, some of them matched with this large log resummation where the final states look clean and well-defined. If we have real events, like the one that I showed you before, they are more messy, and we need to connect the fixed order or we summed QCD and electric calculation to realistic simulation of the hadronic final state. To do that, 
we need Parton Shower Monte Carlo event generator that bridge the gap from the hard interaction scale, which is Q, down to the hadronization scale, which is about one GV. And these need to be able to describe the arbitrary number of parton branching to dress the parton with radiation and turn them into hadron. That's something I don't have time to talk about, but just to say there has been a huge progress in Monte Carlo tools. So we really have next to leading order calculation plus parton shower, which is well established. They're automated and they are used in all the advanced LHC analysis. The frontier now is to go to NNLO matched with this parton shower and also go to next leading log parton shower and so on. And this is what really bridge the theory to up to the final prediction that we give to the experimental level. Okay, um, to conclude, I just wanted to, I hope I was able to convey you how uh, beautiful and fascinating are the challenges of precision physics. And the community has moved forward to an incredible rate. And still, despite this progress, there is a lot of interesting and necessary work to do. To do. So I only had the time to mention a few of these frontiers. So the next to next leading order for higher multiplicity, the next cube leading order, theory uncertainty, electroweak corrections and matching with QCD corrections, heavy flavor schemes, large log resummations, next to next leading order plus parton shower, and a low parton shower, but I'm sure there is much more than what I had time to mention today. Tomorrow I will talk about PDS, which I mentioned several times today. And uh, on Wednesday, uh, I want to talk about um, the crosstalk between precision as the key to new physics discovery. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Maria, for this nice overview on um, theoretical prediction. So, question time. There are questions? Actually, I have a question. I am not an expert on this, on this, uh, this field. I work on string theory, so completely in opposite direction. <laughs> So, but I'm curi curious, you have discussed a lot about perturbative prediction of QCD, but what about non-perturbative correction? Are these correction assess, correction like one over alpha, alpha strong, are these correction necessary to, take, uh, to, to compare theory with experiment or are just systematic errors that you take in account in some way? So it's, Yes, so that, that's a very important question. So I think there are different kinds of non perturbative correction. So the whole thing I, so this um, factorization that I was mentioning here, um, which is what we use in order to, to do this uh, factorization, you know, th there are these terms that um, are the non perturbative correction to that. So for example, uh, when we talk about hadronization, so we, if we want to, to make predictions for exclusive states, you know, when we, you actually look at some hadron, you need an hadronization models, and these are based on either string theory or some clustering models. And these are very important in order to, you know, to go from what I write here to the actual exclusive prediction that you have. So for example, if you want to be more exclusive in the kind of hadrons, you, you definitely have a large systematic associated with this model. Um, so, and the other non-perturbative aspect is the part of distribution functions because the dependence of these functions from these uh, Z1 and Z2 is something that cannot be predicted by mean perturbative QCD. We need, um, in non perturbative input that until lattice is able to compute them, we don't know. So we have to extract it from the data, like the parameters of these uh, clustering and hadronization models. So I think uh, these are very important aspects that, you know, until there is not a breakthrough in a, some kind of techniques that allows the computation of these non perturbative things, we have to extract them from the data. To extract them from the data means that we have some error. 
but we use also lattice QCD to predict this uh, non perturbative reaction. Yeah, yeah, some of them, yes. So, and the error that we have is the, the error of the lattice analysis. But for example, the PDFs, it's something that um, there is a lot of activity in trying to compute some the momenta and now even some of the dependence on Z1 and Z2 from the lattice. Mm. It's not yet at the level that can be trusted uh, or can be used in QCD okay. analysis, but if the lattice was advancing to a level where they could give us, uh, at least for the quark, no, the parameterization, that it would be, um, uh, if you want, more precise than what we do now. Okay. okay. 